I gathered with over 100 CEOs and they were asked what their biggest challenge was. Overwhelmingly, 90% of that feedback had to do with people. Welcome to Tip Top, Grow Up Your Business with Metronomics. Join me, Shannon burns Susco, and Metronomics Certified Coach, Jed Roberts. We'll be talking to business thought leaders, entrepreneurs, CEOs, and business team coaches who have all taken the journey to grow up their businesses to their tip top. We'll be sharing strategies, systems, stories, and how you can grow your company up at the speed you want. If you're searching for your path to the tip top and feel your time is running out, then this podcast is for you. Welcome, everyone. Welcome back. With us, joining us, is Dr. Pamela carrington Rato, a metronomic certified coach. Pamela specializes in guiding teams through leadership development, aligning company culture, and optimizing business growth. Pamela's journey started before the age of 13, working with her grandmother at Marquet's dress shop. Pamela's early lessons continue to shape her approach today. We're incredibly happy to have Pamela in our community, helping CEOs and leadership teams grow their companies. I'm excited that Pamela's here. So we can talk about leadership, people growth, and what it takes to build an engaged culture. Welcome, I'm so glad you're here and uh, we're gonna have a good time as you can tell. Absolutely, Shannon, thank you. That was a very generous. (laughs) <laughs> and now we know why it's so important that we learn from you today, connect with you today, and have a really good conversation. So I'm just going to go right into it. When you're working with CEOs, what are you finding their biggest challenges, just in a general sense today, and, and thinking about what are their constraints? You know, Shannon, it's interesting because I actually have some data on this. Um, that was I gathered recently in a gathering with over 100 CEOs, and they were asked what their biggest challenge was. And I decided to take notes. You know me. I'm an avid take note taker. And I decided to take notes and then go back and count. And overwhelmingly, 90% of that feedback had to do with people. And it broke down into four categories. Finding and developing a player talent was huge. That was the biggest category. Also creating a culture of engagement and accountability, as well as leadership development. And then just CEO capacity and ability um, was in there. Yeah, I love the last one, CEO capacity and ability, because we know That goes back to people, right? When we get the right people on the right seats and the seats are designed, the organization's designed, we actually get time back. What, um, from your experience um, and working with CEOs, what are some of the things when you recognize this, see this, those four things, what are some of the things that, you know, you're working with your clients, your CEO and leadership teams talking about? What are some of the things that you work through with them? We start with A players sitting around the leadership team table, right? The executive table, as well as cohesive and aligned team. And a lot of times I have clients who, as I'm coming in and getting involved, the CEO will say, we're already cohesive, or we're already aligned, or we have those tough conversations. And um, and so great. It's always wonderful to build on competencies. Oftentimes, though, when we get into the challenging content decisions, strategic thinking that aligns with the business growth that we do, some of those things break down um, or are noticeably absent. And so depending on where we are, we dive into that. And I tend to use scorecards as a way really start to level set the CEO and the leadership team. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting because there's been lots of discussions about scorecards. Um, Can you describe a little bit more about the scorecard that you use with your team and, you know, thinking about, you know, there are scorecards that, that we see in different, you know, operating systems and whatnot, and just really talk about maybe the metronomic scorecard and the scorecard that you use with your team. 
Sure. The scorecard that I use, which is the metronomics scorecard, I think I, I've i never found anything that I don't elaborate on a little bit. So I add a bit to the standard metronomics scorecard. And, um, and I think that's a plus that we can, depending on clients, but I do it in a standardized way. And so the scorecard is going to give the purpose or mission of the position and connect it to the financial aspect of that position. And then we have the capabilities, the competencies, the key performance metrics that need to be completed. And it just provides a huge amount of clarity. Um, Core values are also on scorecards. And so that becomes a really good place to say, what does it look like to live the core values as, you know, a CEO and leadership team member? Because a lot of times when core values are developed, um, that question is thought of generally across the company, but not specifically to what does it need to look like for us to carry that torch and to really model the way. Yeah. And when... When you're working with teams, uh, you know, with scorecards, um, what what are the challenges? Because we hear, you know, we talk to, you know, what are the challenges that you have faced? And what are the, you know, what are the wins, you know, in working with scorecards with teams? One of the challenges is the CEO needs to go first. And sometimes the CEO is thinking of the leadership team as where we start. And so that is generally not a challenge for long because the CEOs that we work with tend to want to really dive in and get going. And a great way to do that is to start with them. And then another challenge for CEOs is just putting way too much on their scorecard. And I don't mind that because then we can tease that apart and cascade those, you know, responsibilities and metrics to other team members. But I think it it says a lot when a CEO comes back with just a highly packed scorecard. And it also provides evidence a lot of times that they're just overwhelmed and that there's a lot going on. Well, I and I think the other thing we see quite a bit, um, I was thinking about it's such a nice way to say, look, the, we get them to do, you know, CEO scorecards first. Um, you can see how full it is. You can see that, you know, in doing that, they're they're wearing many hats and they're owning too many things. And it allows us to share it with others, which is fabulous. Now I'm gonna take a step back and go a little bit to your your know, earlier experiences around leadership. And I'm curious to know what early experiences you had that sort of shaped your approach, your interests to leadership. And then how do they influence the way you coach today? Well, you mentioned one of them, and that was starting working at my grandmother's dress yeah. shop really early on. And she let me know that when we were at work, she was Mrs. West, not grandmother. So that tells you oh, a lot. I love that. Love and, that. And so that was an experience of leadership that really involved my grandmother modeling the way and setting clear expectations for me in how I led, even as a young girl, um, in the dress shop. And But fast forward across multiple different leadership experiences, and I think one that influenced me really deeply was when I was CEO in the behavioral health industry. And um, it was typical at that time for frontline workers to day, maybe nine months in a position yes. because it's just such challenging and difficult work. And um, so I walked into an organizational situation where the door was not just revolving, it was spinning. <laughs> and that's not great in no. a relational and transformational industry. And so I really had to step back in my leadership and think about what mattered most. And yes, it was really important for um, everyone to have, you know, cultural alignment. And it was really important for everyone to have the skills and expectations and abilities to do the job. 
However, that didn't stop the revolving door. What stopped it was investing in the people as leaders and starting that from day one and steeping that within the culture so that they became such a critical part of the culture, such a critical part of the overall team, such a critical part of the mission and the strategy of the organization that we literally turned that short-term employment um, environment into a long-term employment environment and averaged 5.8 years. Um, boys. So it was quite a flip. And it was really by investing in everyone as leaders from the moment they came into the door and making sure that we set those clear expectations and then cultivated each individual as a leader within the organization. Now, that's incredible because we know that investment in leadership, you know, turns things around. That That's a significant turnaround, which is which is expected when you invest. Now, a lot of people are probably wondering, how long did that take? How long did it take to turn it around? It took about three years to really, really move the needle. You know, you start to make those changes and initially people think, well, this will never last. And that's an industry where trends tend to come through. But I think that's true across industries. And so, um, and also making sure we, we talked a lot about authentic voice and choice and really listening to the voice of the organization and then filtering that into the, the, str the strategy and the execution of the organization. Yeah. And, you know, I, I appreciate the three years and, and sort of managing the expectations to that, you know, because humans are involved and it takes us a little bit, number one, to evolve our behavior Two, to actually trust, you know, what's happening. And then three, to get excited about that it's really working. And so it, it's hard to just flick the switch. But, you know, I heard what you said. You, you know, the program started right away. You know, you didn't, it, it wasn't like, oh, we're going to just, you know, stop this in. You know, the program started right away when it was acknowledged and knowing that something needed to change. And, you know, Shannon, if I can add one thing to it, that was, when I first realized, because we were an accelerating organization, we were growing and had opportunities to grow. And that was when I first realized that if the organization grew more quickly or more deeply than the people, it was going to be like this rubber band stretching, 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 because the needs and the drive of the organization were going to outpace the people. And so that was when I really first observed and thought deeply about how do we get those two things in sync? How do we make sure that we aren't overly stretching? Because when you're a growing organization, you grow, right? The organization grows, the people grow, the organization grows. They don't always sync up really well. And we came up with creative strategies for making sure that everyone was aligned with the strategy and growing at the pace they needed to grow. Right. That is such an important piece is growing at the pace that, of the organization. And we see it all the time. You know, we work with uh, high growth companies and it's a matter of, and I love where it started, it's a matter of starting with the leadership team to actually acknowledge, you know, be aware and invest in it. Now, can you share a story or an example of how leadership has directly impacted a company's success or turnaround? Sure. I'll speak to a situation um, that I observed with a client, and it was a pretty typical scenario where the found there were co-founders of the organization. And they invested blood, sweat, and tears, you know, into this organization to breathe it into existence and um, were really like in the business yeah. a lot in order to help it grow. And they, they experienced exponential growth and didn't change the way that they were leading. And so uh, when I... Um, came into the company as a coach, 
I noticed that they were at every level of the organization. It was like they were popping up here, there, and everywhere. And it was so unsettling and destabilizing to yeah. the organization. However, it was done with the best of intentions. And there wasn't a pathway for, you know, getting refocused on the business instead of so much in the business. And they just didn't have a pathway for that. So we developed a pathway for them to really be outward facing, which is truly what the company needs, yeah. and to develop a leadership pipeline where there is now a president who is helping to lead the executive team or the leadership team. And it's cascading all through the organization um, at every level. And there's they, they're calling it a leadership pipeline. They're doing training now for it. They've set expectations. Scorecards were non-existent. So there we go. Back to scorecards. Yeah, card. back to scorecards. Yep. Scorecards. And the, um, the founders are so happy because they don't have to parachute in everywhere. Right. More. Right. Um, and so now... We're talking a lot about how they coach. They coach right. the president. The president coaches the leadership team right. and right. Our, our organization. So it's been a real turnaround, and they are continuing on their high gro growth journey. Um, and I would say with a lot more freedom than what they had initially. Yeah. And just for the listeners who, who may not understand the working in the business and the working on the business, can you give that a little bit more color? And because your story goes from, you know, they're deep in the business to, you know, working on the business, but just give that a little bit more color. So people who are maybe in that situation listening in really are clear on where, where they are on their journey. It's always a good question. And it's truly a look in the mirror moment, I think, for leaders <laughs> to think about this because it's really easy to be in the business because typically either you're an entrepreneur, founder, and so you started in the business or you grew up through the business and growing up through the business or being an entrepreneurial founder puts you in the business. And that can serve people for a bit of time. And you can do a lot of scaling that way. It's exhausting, but it can be done. And so what we mean by on the business is stepping away from the tactical and execution side of the business and going deeply into the strategic and cultural side of the business and really planning out. And so that's where we are looking at that cultural side of the BHAG and, you know, how the purpose is realized and then going deeply into strategy and that requires stepping away from the business, trusting that you have the leadership that you need to keep the everyday going and to keep that tactical excellence going so that you can, as a leader and as an executive or leadership team, really work on the business, thinking about the strategic positioning of the business things that we do like the market map and attribution framework and really knowing and understanding who your customer is and pointing everything you do um, toward that particular customer. And um, those things take time and it does not work if you are answering email and sending texts about the daily activities or the tactical things that are going on um, at the same time you're trying to think more deeply and analytically. So I always say you can't multitask in the business and on the business. They're two different things. And we like to see leaders, you know, really stretching toward 80% on the business at least. Right. And, you know, so many, we, we run into so many leaders who are, you know, executing in the business. They're in the business. They, they actually don't want to be in the business but they can't find that way to get out of the business, like get out of the day to day. And I can tell you, even in my own journeys this year, running into so many CEOs who are really, really tired. Um, what are some of the things you can suggest for them that they should be thinking about 
uh, in order, number one, to build their awareness. Because sometimes until someone comes out from comes in from the outside, they're they're not necessarily seeing it. They're understanding all the consequences of it. They're usually really tired. But what can you suggest they do in order to, you know, get one foot further away from being in the business? Just something that they could like start out with today. So I'll mention two things. One is to look at your leadership team and determine whether they're all A players. And if your leadership team isn't A players, that needs to come first. So assuming they have scorecards and you are able to truly look, um, and it's it's brutal fact, you may not have all A players around that table. And if you don't, it can't cascade out from there. So that's the first step. And then something that I challenge the CEOs I work with, um, it's just a question and it's how much innovation are you doing? Because if you are in the business, oftentimes you may think you're innovating, but what you're really doing is just continuous improvement. And there's a huge difference. You have to be on the business to innovate. And so I ask CEOs I work with to reflect on that question, because if you find that innovation has just become a lot of continu continuous improvement projects, then you're probably highly in the business. And most CEOs want to innovate, right? It's, I mean, it's a necessity. And so that provides some context and also some motivation for making changes. Right. I love those two things. The, the, they're great. I want to ask you one more clarifying question around the first step is ensuring you have A players around your leadership team, around the table who are, you know, there working with you. Can you, uh, just for, for listeners, A player gets thrown around all over the place. Can you give, uh, you know, a definition or define A player? So that people really understand, uh, you know, what that means. Sure. Yes, we shouldn't throw terms around without defining them. <laughs> well, I'm getting better at catching them because we talk in these. But like then if I think about, you know, if I'm listening for the first time, I don't know what an A player is, though. I think it means I need really good people on my team around the table, you know, to support me. But they may already think that. Right. So the question then is, what is a really good person and um, in that regard? And so what we look at is core value alignment. So that's alignment with the culture. And we want to see high core value alignment. And we also want to see a high level of productivity within the leadership realm. So we're not talking about individual productivity like a, you know, a startup worker, um, but high levels of productivity as defined by their scorecard and their um, metrics and KPIs. And so if you think of that as the Y axis having the core value alignment and the X axis having KPIs or performance, we want to see someone far out there in the top right corner um, if they are sitting around the leadership table. What if they, they don't have scorecards yet? But the, the, you know, the CEOs just, you know, wants to gut this out. Is that a recommended thing to do? What, what should they do if they just haven't had time to do, you know, a, a scorecard of any kind? Like they're, they're really in this high growth mode. You know, what do you recommend? Gutting it out. <laughs> Stop. By the card Because they know they have a lot of observational evidence. And, you know, sometimes it takes getting brutally honest with yourself. It's hard because you have relationships as a CEO. We have relationships with everyone around the table. And sometimes family members are also around the table. Um, however, to stop in the name of getting scorecards done, you may not be getting scorecards done because you don't have eight players around the table. So then it becomes chicken and an egg wrestling match. We don't want that. And so most definitely there are multiple ways that uh, CEOs can gut it out. And one of that, those is using a system by Rob Monson called Grover. 
And it's a beautiful system that allows a CEO to look at their team very, very quickly and repeatedly over time and then cascade that through the rest of the organization without a lot of time investment. It's quick, easy and visual. Yeah. And I appreciate you saying, you know, if we don't have all those pieces in place to gut it out, because we know when we go in to work with a new CEO plus leadership team, uh, the CEO normally knows, you know, may, where, where they probably need to make some adjustments, but just don't have the courage to do it and looking for the support to do that. So I, I love how you just phrase that. And, uh, you know, there's no time like the present to take a good look at your leadership team. And, you know, we recommend every 90 days you take a look at your leadership team and it's, you know, we're in a high growth situation. So things are changing. The roles are changing. You know, the design of the organization will evolve almost every quarter in a high growth situation. Now, you mentioned something that I think is really important that we haven't really dug into. And I I want to make this sort of the last section we we dig into because I know your immense experience in this area, which is building an engaged culture. So maybe, and you mentioned it a little bit around, you know, if we're having a players, they have to be aligned to the core values, which are, you know, represent the, the cultural system in the organization. What are the key elements of building an engaged and connected company culture? Way easier said than done. And how do you coach leaders to foster it? I know you have immense experience in this area. So I'm going to try and just boil this down. (laughs) (laughs) Good, good. (laughs) There's a lot there. Pairing the culture with the leadership is the most significant way that I have found to do that. And so okay, what does that mean? How do we start with that? We know that there are different levels um, within leadership. And I think about leadership, mindful leadership is at every level of the organization. It just looks different, right? The work values look different. The time application looks different. The skills look different at each level. But it's mindful leadership. And we want that pipeline um, to be growing. And so a lot of what I look at with that, Shannon, is if we look, let's just take our individual contributors, right? Those who are coming into the organization. Culture starts at the interview. Culture starts there. Um, As candidates are interviewing and coming into the organization, they have an immediate opportunity to start to absorb and feel drawn into the culture. And so I like to think about, you know, within the systems that we talk about with metronomics, overlaying that with each of these levels that people progress through. So we're gonna start with the human system. We're gonna start with the strategic culture system. And we're also gonna start with the coach cascade system because that's so tied to culture. Right. And so when, a brand new employee or an individual contributor experiences coaching from their direct supervisor, we've started to plant that culture system and that coach cascade system that they will grow within and become a part of. So there's lots of things that we can do with communication, with rhythms, um, Huddles are really critical for right. establishing culture. People, you know, a lot of times we think of huddles for execution. Huddles really yes. with culture. Um, and you know, ha- what our overall cadence is, how we recognize people, how we live our core values. Um, you know, do we ask core value driven questions? Do we focus on core values? I love it when companies give core value awards on a regular basis, you know, so those are more top line things we can do at the deeper level. If we really start being intentional at that individual contributor level, and then as they go to team, we, you know, we enhance that, we build it, right? And they keep getting involved and exposed to more of the seven systems that we live in, in metronomics, 
then we're building not only a leadership pipeline, but a cultural pipeline right. with organization. Right. And, you know, um, you mentioned something very interesting, and I, I seem to be hearing it more and more, just thinking about, you know, what we do with a team. Can you talk a little bit about, a lot of people think culture is a thing, but you just describe culture as a system and a process and bring it alive. Can you sort of talk in your experience, uh, thinking about, you know, a, the culture as a thing versus culture as a way, as a process and a system, and just maybe give a little bit more color to that? Sometimes what I hear from people is culture is your core values. And um, that implies to me that if we know our core values and hang them on the wall or put them on our computer screensaver, that we have culture. And um, so I think that's a simple way of saying culture then is just a thing. And um, it's not a box to check. It's just not a box to check. It is living and breathing and influenced daily by the people of the organization. And so culture needs to align with strategy. And so I oftentimes call it strategic culture alignment because we don't want those paths to veer away from one another. And so we think well beyond just, you know, the core values, although those are critically important. Um, but we think beyond that, we think beyond our big, hairy, audacious goal. We think about how we're aligning people. You know, I had a client where they felt like they had such a great culture. And yet when you heard the voice of those within the company, they didn't feel like they knew what was going on. And things just kept coming at them. And they didn't feel, I mean, for them, it was kind of like, what is going to come next? And where are we headed? And we don't feel a part. And so I think a really critical part of culture today, and this transcends generations, so it's the beautiful thing about it, is that everybody is looking to be a part of something bigger than themselves. And that is a huge part of culture. And maybe the motivations or reasons for that are different across people. But everybody wants to be part of something bigger than themselves. So what a great opportunity that we have when we have a big, hairy, audacious goal and we have our three HAG, three-year highly achievable goal, and we can get everybody aligned with it in the culture and we're all rowing in the same direction, but we all also have a level of voice and engagement within that system. So it's not happening to us, it's happening with us. And I think that's one of the most important things about culture, that I don't feel like things are happening to me, regardless of where I'm seated in the organization. Things are happening with me. And so many times, you know, when... If you talk to a leader uh, in a high growth situation, they want to, you know, skip, you know, skip culture, skip the cultural system, the time it takes, you know, that little bit at every meeting, they want to skip it. And they just want to get that, those hard edge systems that we know is strategy, execution, and cash. Um, can you talk about, you know, the balance between getting that done? Because like, if we focus all on culture, we know that that's not, you know, all of it. If we focus all on strategy, that's not it either. Can you talk about the balance that must exist? And as, you know, as a coach, maybe there's an example you have where you, you have a good example, practical, where a company's gone through this and they successfully engaged in culture that actually, you know, drove the strategy, you know, where it needed to go. Yeah. Well, I think I would just start with the example of a car. And so a, a traditional gas-powered car, right? And if strategy is the engine of the car and we're putting gas in the tank to power that, culture is the oil that greases the engine. And am I going to go on a long car trip or even a short car trip with just gas in the tank and no oil in the engine? It's going to burn out the engine. And that's exactly what happens without culture is we just burn people out 
on the ambitious strategy and execution of the organization because there isn't a culture for them to belong to and align with. And so I know that's not an example of a team, but it's a great way to think about it. Would you do that? No, of course not. That makes no sense. And it doesn't make sense to just drive, 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 drive to that strategy, execution, cash, the hard side of the company without really, um, or hard edge. It's the hard side too sometimes. (laughs) (laughs) Depends on your perspective. (laughs) And uh, and neglect the soft edge of the company. I um, had the privilege of coaching a level five CEO. So that's Jim Collins' ultimate level, yes. personal humility and indomitable will and putting the, you know, the enterprise ahead of personal interests, right? And I had the privilege of coaching a level five CEO. And he was as competitive and aggressive and fast growing as any CEO. And yet the first thing that always came out of his mouth was people are our greatest asset. And he said it over and over and over again. And he didn't just say it. He believed it. He lived it. He acted it. And guess what? That company is about to attain their BHAG. It's because of that balanced approach. Love it. As we, you know, I love that we've talked through leadership, people growth, um, thinking about an engaged culture and, you know, it's about the system around it. The story that you just uh, shared, the practical story around um, thinking about it as a car engine, like I can't get that out of my mind now. I'll, I'll use it often. So I want to thank you for that. Yeah, that is such a good one. Lots of people will relate to that. Do you want to share about your journey uh, as a, you know, as a leader and an entrepreneur and now a CEO plus leadership team coach. What do you want to leave people with thinking about? You know, one of the biggest things I've learned in my journey is the necessity of making mistakes. And um, it's just inherent in us as humans. And sometimes I know that I early on would get analysis paralysis at times and just think we don't have the data we need, we don't have the information we need, we don't have the systems we need. Kind of like your question about what if I don't have scorecards? Can I figure out who my A players are, right? Thinking this has to happen before that can happen or just wanting to get it right. And I find that we work with such amazing CEOs and leadership teams and so many of them want exactly that. Yet, It's in the mistakes that we find the learning. They have sons, they're competitive athletes for, you know, up through college. And we always talked about the amazing learnings that happen from the losses and the errors. And they're painful, but they stick with you. And so I think I would say, you know, it's better to make a wrong decision than no decision. It's better to learn, do an after action review and look at what new learnings you and your team have from things that don't go quite the way you expected. But get out there and have the humility and yet the confidence to move forward in growing in metronomics and with your coach and know that through these kinds of systems, through the A player leadership team and a really great coach, uh, you're not alone. And there's more freedom on the other side once we break through it. Love it. That was excellent way to wrap that up. Um, tell me how and tell the listeners how they can learn more about you. Where would they go to learn more about you? Well, they could go to my LinkedIn page. Um, to learn more about me. And I also am happy to connect with people. So reaching out to me by email, I tend to be very relational. So reaching out to me by email is fine as well. Love it. Love it. Well, thank you so much for being here. Um, I loved our conversation about, you know, just thinking about leaders, leadership. I love how you talked about freedom, right? Working on the business and in the business. And of course, you know, building that engaged culture 
that will just make all the difference in the world around ensuring you're heading in the right direction because you can leverage your team in order to work together to get there. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you for being an amazing metronomic certified coach. We love having you in the community. If you want to learn more and connect with Pamela, please reach out through LinkedIn, her email, and uh, thank you for being here. Have a good day. Thank you, Shannon. Tip Top is brought to you by Metronomics. To find out more about Metronomics and how this proven 20-year-old system will save you time and money as you grow up your business, visit metronomics.com. That is M-E-T-R-O-N-O-M-I-C-S dot com. Share your thoughts on today's episode in the comments and suggest topics you'd love us to explore the next time. Also search for Metronomics in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and anywhere else the great podcasts are found.